to a new episode of Veil Lifted, a video essay where I discuss fascinating cases that involve secrecy and discovery. Before we get into today's episode, I did want to thank today's sponsor, which is Native. What I look for in deodorants and body self-care products generally is for them to be natural and as free of chemicals as possible. In fact, Native deodorants are aluminum, paraben, and sulfate-free, as well as vegan and cruelty-free. They also have natural and familiar scents such as coconut oil and shea butter. A great aspect of Native is that the deodorant dries quickly and lasts all day. Recently, I've been using the cotton and cedar wood one. I tend to like pretty much every single scent that the native deodorants come in, but I do gravitate towards wood type scents. I feel like they're great for pretty much any season and they're subtle yet smell good. Two other scents by Native that I enjoy and I believe I've already mentioned this one. There's this one which is the Cucumber Mint which is a really great one for the summer because it just smells like you're out at the beach, according to my husband. So I love that smell, especially if you wanna wear it in the fall when it's gray and rainy. And then the other one that I really like is this one. So this one, I think is the most neutral scented one of all of them. Obviously, if you just smell it like this, yes, it does have a smell of cleanliness, but aside from that, it is extremely neutral. So if you like something with a tiny bit of fragrance, I would suggest this one. Three deodorants are normally $36, but if you use my link and my code, you'll get them for $24. That's 33 off with free shipping. Thank you again to Native for sponsoring this video. We often hear about small cities in a positive light. We see films, television shows, and read books where small towns are synonymous with the quaint, everybody knowing everybody, a sense of community and peace, charming quietness, sometimes even serenity. That is why when places such as Circleville are taken over by fear, aggression, and manipulation, it seems all the more daunting. Almost as if there were a purity that suddenly vanished into nothingness at the drop of a hat. However, this case also demonstrates that the pleasant exterior of these small cities is often deceiving, as humans are human no matter where they live and vices carried within each one of us to varying degrees. Circleville, Ohio, a city 25 miles south of Columbus, has a current population of about 14,000 people and has stayed relatively consistent since the late 70s when the population was in the 11,000s. Since 1903, Circleville was famed for an annual festival called the Circleville Pumpkin Show. Looking at photographs of Circleville, one might not guess that historically it has been a rather crime-ridden city. Even as recently as 2018, Circleville's crime rate was higher than 85.3% of U.S. cities, theft and burglaries being the most prominent of crimes committed. In 1976, Circleville's scenery changed drastically. This is when the city became terrorized by what we now refer to as the Circleville Letters. This peculiar case involves a few people, so prior to proceeding with what allegedly occurred, let's introduce them and contextualize their relationships. Firstly, there's Mary Gillespie. Mary is the beginning point of this case. Mary was a school bus driver. Mary's husband was Ron Gillespie. Ron Gillespie had a sister called Karen, who was married to a man named Paul Freshour. Lastly, the local school superintendent was named Gordon Massey. His involvement will be explained later, but for now it is important to recall these five people and how they're connected to each other to fully internalize what occurred and to perhaps deduce why. Residents of Circleville, Ohio began to receive strange and personal letters that described very personal details of their lives. Mary Gillespie was one of the people who received such a letter. In the letter, Mary was accused of having an affair with Gordon Massey, the local school superintendent. The letter was postmarked as coming from Columbus and unsurprisingly had no return address. Aside from the alarming nature of receiving such a letter out of nowhere, the anonymous writer said that he or she had been monitoring the house and even knew about her children. The letter was clearly threatening in nature, ending with, everything will be over soon. The handwriting itself contained an eerie element as it seemed mechanical and almost robust. Robotic. Mary did not mention the letter to her husband, Ron. However, eight days later, she received another letter that was very similar to the first one, still urging her to end her affair or else she'd suffer the consequences. Ron did not stay in the dark for long, as 14 days later, he received his own letter from the Circleville writer. Ron's letter was more extreme still. The writer told Ron to end his wife's alleged affair with Gordon Massey. If he didn't comply, then the writer claimed that they'd go to the media, broadcasting it on radios, billboards, and televisions, and that Ron would die. However, Ron and Mary Gillespie were not the only ones receiving letters. It is alleged that thousands of letters of similar nature were sent to the residents of Circleville. This created a circus between people turning on each other, people's reputations ruined due to gossip, and the way suspicion sours relationships generally. An anonymous writer who happened to know everyone's business was airing it out rather publicly. It is not 
not surprising that people began to look over their shoulders. No one was safe from either physical or mental repercussions. Needless to say, this was a very cruel and manipulative method to deal with others' personal lives. Effectively, in some ways, the writer was turning these people's lives into a spectacle that initially was just for him or herself, but that would allegedly go public if they did not comply with the demands. Mary and Ron Gillespie only told those closest to them about the letters. Ron's sister, Karen, her husband, Paul Freshour, and Paul's sister. Apparently, some of the letters were signed with a W at the end. Mary, Ron, Karen, and Paul got to brainstorming who could be behind the psychological torture. They concluded that the W could stand for William Massey, Gordon Massey's son. William Massey was a logical person to suspect, as he likely would want to protect his mother from the pain of finding out about the alleged affair between his father, Gordon, and Mary Gillespie. Their affair would directly affect him and change his and his mother's life negatively, so perhaps this was his method to try and dissolve it before it became public. As time went on, perhaps the frustration got the best of him and he no longer wanted to take a subtle route, but one that was out for blood. Paul ended up writing a series of letters to William Massey asking him to halt writing these disconcerting threats. The letters then stopped. While one can conclude this confirmed it was William, it also could have been a mere coincidence. Coincidence is a significant factor in the case of the Circleville letters, as there never truly was confirmation to suspicion. However, the piece lasted for a very short time. After a mere few weeks, the letters began once more. Ron received letters that alleged he was being watched, his car was being monitored, and threats were again made against his life. Nine months after the first letter was received, in August of 1977, Everything escalated dramatically. On a day like any other, Ron was at home with his children when he received a phone call. To this day, it is unknown what exactly was said during the call, but it is clear it came from the Circleville writer. Apparently, Ron had been debating confronting the writer, and after the phone call, his decision was solidified, and as soon as he hung up, he made his way out. Ron grabbed his pistol and angrily got into his car, ready to address the situation in perhaps the last way he knew how. Tragically, Ron crashed into a tree only down his own street and died. To many, this coincidence seemed too unlikely. A man whose life had been consistently threatened suddenly crashes his car after a phone call from the person guilty of the threats? How likely was that? Well, the sheriff, Dwight Radcliffe, too, suspected foul play initially. After Ron's autopsy, it was determined that he had a blood alcohol level that was twice the legal limit. It was 0.16. To the sheriff, this was enough to deem the death a car accident. However, to those who knew Ron, it did not make sense, as he was said to only be an occasional drinker who certainly did not drink himself to the point of drunkenness. However, it still made logical sense that if his blood alcohol level was in fact that high, a crash under the influence was not unrealistic. As always though, the case only complicated itself further when forensic analysis was done on Ron's pistol. They found that one bullet had been shot, but none was recovered at the scene of the crash or in his car. The bullet was nowhere to be found, and his destroyed pickup truck was very quickly discarded, so any further analysis or theories could not legitimately be made. All in all, from the alleged accident to how things were managed from an authority standpoint, the death was suspicious, everything considered. Mary continued to receive letters. This time the letters were perhaps the least of her problems as the Circleville writer decided to double down and invest in posters around the city. Much like the letters, the posters referred to her alleged affair with Gordon Massey. The escalation became even more severe as the writer now involved Mary's children. The writer threatened Mary's young daughter, who was only 12 at the time. Unfortunately, this was not to be the end of the continued nightmare. Mary Gillespie and Gordon Massey finally admitted to their affair a whole six years after the first letter was received. However, they claimed the relationship began legitimately only after Ron had passed away and after Massey had divorced his wife. Therefore, according to them, it had never really been an affair, but simply a relationship that began without betrayal. Not many people believe this version of the story. Even after this admission, the Circleville writer was not appeased and continued to harass thousands of people in the city. As previously mentioned, Mary's daughter had began to be targeted by the Circleville writer. The threats to her life in and of themselves were enough to cause extreme fear, but it only got worse and more cruel. In 1983, while at her job driving the bus, Mary came across a sign on the side of the road that claimed that Mary's daughter and Gordon Massey were having an affair. At this point, Mary's daughter was still a minor, and therefore the implication went beyond just an affair, but made Gordon Massey appear as a depraved man preying on a child. At this point, Mary had had enough of the continued mental abuse. She pulled over and went to take down the sign. This was no typical sign, though it was attached to a box. Once she opened the box, she saw it was a poorly made booby trap. There was a string attached to the trigger, so whomever opened the box would get shot. Luckily, the poor design saved Mary's life and no harm came to her. Mary took the device home, perhaps unsure of what to do with it or what to surmise from this situation. Eventually, she did bring the pistol to the police. What they discovered was alarming. The serial number appeared to be somewhat filed out in order to maintain anonymity, but the job was not well done. Once they ran the serial number, the authorities found that the pistol belonged to Ron's brother-in-law, Paul Freshour. When interrogated by the police, Freshour claimed the pistol had been stolen, 
but only after the police asked him to show where he usually stored his pistol at home. The fact he hadn't made a police report about the stolen firearm did not bode well, and the authorities then asked him to copy the handwriting from the letters as best he could. Sheriff Radcliffe did not believe in Fresh Hour's innocence and arrested him for the attempted murder of Mary Gillespie. On October 24th, 1983, Paul Fresh Hour's trial began. Some claim it was a lost cause before it even began. The thousands of letters sent to the residents of the city created such vitriol that even if Fresh Hour did try to defend himself, people may have already decided he was guilty even without evidence. Also, since the letters had been sent over half a decade, people wanted closure, an answer, and to simply shut this chapter. They were likely to hang on to whomever was claimed as guilty first. During his trial, Fresh Hour did not take the stand at his lawyer's advice, as the thousands of letters sent would become admissible as opposed to only the ones sent to Mary. Although the people in the city were incandescent with anger, there were a few key points that did point to Fresh Hour's potential innocence. Firstly, the writing samples that were referred to prior, when Fresh Hour was interrogated, were not particularly legitimate evidence. The fact that Sheriff Radcliffe had specifically instructed Fresh Hour how to write made the sample a forced one, rather than one that genuinely showed Fresh Hour's writing pattern. Aside from that, the analysis of the booby trap did not find that Fresh Hour owned any of the materials required. They also did not find any ammunition for the pistol that the booby trap contained. To prove how the court of public opinion was truly biased against Fresh Hour, he even supplied an alibi for the entire day, and still, he was found guilty of attempted murder. He was sentenced to 7 to 25 years in prison. As the residents of Circleville proved to be in a rush to deem someone culpable, even though the pieces didn't fit together, Everyone thought they could breathe easy now. One aspect of the case that should have kept people vigilant was that there had been witnesses that had testified they'd seen a man lingering around the area where the sign was. They even saw him right by where the booby trap had been placed, and he allegedly was near an orange El Camino. Fresh Hour did not own an El Camino, and based on the description, the man did not look like Fresh Hour either. Though the residents believe this grim chapter had ended, they were in for a sore surprise. While serving his time, Paul Freshour received a letter with the same mechanical writing that read, Shame how things work out, but better you than me. The sheriff says you did it, but we know better, don't we? The residents, too, continued to receive letters. Seemingly refusing to consider that perhaps it wasn't really Freshour, many assumed he was sending them from prison somehow. They believed this was a ploy by Freshour. If the residents continued to receive letters, then maybe some would begin to doubt Fresh Hour's apparent guilt and he'd find his way out of prison. Unfortunately, the possibility of someone else being the Circleville writer was simply not in the scope of the authorities. In fact, Fresh Hour was placed in solitary to make sure he didn't allegedly smuggle out more letters. Though there was enough reason to doubt that Fresh Hour wasn't the writer, Sheriff Radcliffe stated that he believed Fresh Hour was the right man and that the letters were still sent as a ploy. Radcliffe truly wanted to appease the residents of Circleville and have them return to a comfortable state of mind. In fact, Tessa Unwin, who was the spokeswoman for the state prison system, said she deemed it impossible for Fresh Hour to smuggle letters out. She underlined that he was being very closely watched, and thus there would be no opportunity for him to get letters out. As letters continued to be received by residents, it seemed like the public slowly opened themselves to the possibility that he was not actually involved in any of it. In 1988, Fresh Hour applied for parole, but he was denied. To further try to prove his innocence, he even subjected himself to multiple polygraph tests, which he passed. While polygraphs have been debunked and are not admissible in court, Along with all the other inconsistencies, Fresh Hour deserved some semblance of the benefit of the doubt. In 1994, after slightly over a decade in prison, Fresh Hour was released. What truly cemented that he was likely innocent were the statements from wardens who had been monitoring him. They agreed that it was extremely improbable that he had been sending the letters from prison. Once he was released, Fresh Hour put together a detailed document of almost 200 pages. The document contained his own narrative as to what occurred and why. He made the bold claim that he was used as a scapegoat for a large level of corruption the city was dealing with. He involved the FBI claiming Sheriff Radcliffe was guilty to some degree as he chose to pin the crimes on Fresh Hour in order to keep the crime rate down so he could be appointed as National Sheriff's Association President. If the city had a high crime rate, he'd not even be considered. Fresh Hour's claims ran deep and alluded to such an intense level of corruption that they even accused the sheriff of burying other unsolved murder cases to maintain a clean image of the city. In 1993, a PI and journalist named Martin Yant was looking into the Circleville letters for an article he was writing. Yant did a significant amount of heavy lifting as he pieced together information from the late 1970s as well as up to almost present Day. One figure that Yant believes is part of the story is a man named David Longberry. Longberry is often left out of the Circleville letters narrative, even though there is a reason to believe he may be involved to some extent. Longberry was a colleague of Mary's, a fellow bus driver. He had apparently had romantic feelings towards Mary. Once he made advances towards her, she rejected him. He did not take the rejection lightly, and Yant believes that it is a possibility that to appease his own rage and disappointment, Longberry began writing these threatening letters. Another aspect of this case that further complicates potential conclusions is related to Fresh Hour 
Shower's ex-wife, Karen Sorek. Karen and Paul Fresh Shower were getting divorced relatively shortly before he was arrested for the attempted murder of Mary Gillespie. The divorce between Karen and Paul was arduous. There were multiple layers that created internal chaos. On one hand, Karen had not been faithful to Paul and was even caught. Therefore, she automatically was bound to lose a significant amount. Once the divorce occurred, Karen was hit hard. She not only lost custody over their children, she lost their home and almost everything else. Due to her sudden change in status, she ended up living in a trailer on the Gillespie's property. That is when Karen admitted to Mary that her ex-husband was a Circleville writer. As outsiders observing the past, many of us will look at this and think that perhaps Karen was trying to get some revenge on the man who took away her regular life from her. It would not be unrealistic to consider she would blame him for the letters to get vengeance over losing her children at home. Yant was quoted saying, in my 22 years as a journalist and investigator, I don't think I ever met an individual so confused with such irrational hatred for another and a willingness to say anything, no matter how provably false, to defame him. One big detail that seems to have gone without notice that Yant specifically pointed out was that the El Camino that had been spotted matched the one that Karen's brother owned. In conclusion, it is difficult to surmise who is guilty if there is even only one guilty party. Knowing the history between David Longberry and Mary Gillespie, he seems to be a likely culpable party. However, it almost seems impossible to explain why thousands of residents were receiving letters. Would one man truly go to that extent to cover his tracks? To find out about the private business of thousands around the city? How would one even do that? Considering another theory, would Karen, Fresh Hour's ex-wife, get a brother to help her ruin her ex-husband who took away so much from her? Would she truly be willing to invest years of her life to keep the charade alive? It seems like there are no answers, but only more questions. In fact, in 2012, Unsolved Mysteries covered this case, and interestingly, they too received a letter from the Circleville writer that read, Forget Circleville, Ohio. Do nothing to hurt Sheriff Radcliffe. If you come to Ohio, you El Sickos will pay the Circleville writer. What are we to believe now? So personally, I find that this case was a shit show, even writing about it and researching it. There are so many different accounts in different orders that it was truly complicated to find what lined up best and what actually made sense so that when I told you guys about it, it wouldn't be super confusing. Frankly, I tend to believe that maybe there was just more than one writer. It's difficult for me to believe that someone would be able to know everyone's business, like thousands of people, and send thousands of letters, and also potentially maintain a job unless they weren't working, and some kind of social life that didn't make them the obvious culprit, if that makes sense. So I really wonder, and I think that the thing that complicates this case severely is that there's so many people that it could technically be, like Longberry wouldn't be a long shot, Karen Sorek wouldn't be a long shot, Paul Freshour is probably the longest shot out of all of them because nonetheless, I don't really think he was getting the letters out from prison. So I even wonder, considering that the Unsolved Mysteries people got a letter as recently as 2012, I just wonder whether maybe even the sheriff might have been involved because the fact that even the latest letter said, oh, don't hurt the sheriff is interesting, especially if we go by Paul Freshour's account that like the sheriff was trying to get appointed. Frankly, I don't have much of a conclusion because it's so messy and so layered. Anyways, guys, you can let me know what you think in the comments down below. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you to my patrons as always, and let's get right into the fan art.